Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us again in another Tuesday of essay discussions. This essay isn't about isn't Ayn Rand, but it's about Ayn Rand, and it's written by Dr. Pickoff. It's my 30 years with Ayn Rand. Um, as always, we have James Balance to discuss these issues. Uh, so let me jump right into the question, James. Uh, could you talk a bit more uh, about Dr. Peikoff's relationship with Ayn Rand? Oh, well, Dr. Peikoff had one of the most extraordinary relationships, intellectual relationships, I think, in all of intellectual history <laughs> between a student and a mentor, truly, truly of historic scale on that kind. He was a 17-year-old when he first met Ayn Rand at her home in Los Angeles, you know, that uh, famous Richard Neutra modernistic home that she had when she lived in Hollywood. That's actually where he met her at the age of 17. His first cousin and her boyfriend were attending the University of California at Los Angeles and had become acquainted with Ayn Rand. And so it was through his first cousin that he had a chance when he visited Los Angeles to actually meet Ayn Rand in person and have his first philosophical discussion with her. His own, he was brought up in Winnipeg, Canada. His dad was actually a very prominent medical doctor, a physician, just as his brother was. His mother was a band leader. And he had intended to be a physician himself to go to medical school. Uh, and so after some pre-med, his discussion, uh, education, his uh, uh, discussions with Ayn Rand led him to uh, change his career plans altogether. It was Ayn Rand who convinced him of the um, epical importance of philosophy, something he had not realized before. And so when he moved to New York City in uh, 1951 to start attending university, uh, the New York University, uh, he started studying philosophy there, where Ayn Rand was living starting in 1951 uh, until her death uh, in Midtown Manhattan. So while he was attending university, studying philosophy at NYU from very prominent philosophers, his dissertation advisor was the leading pragmatist philosopher in America at the time, Sidney Hook. And after some 14 years of higher education, pre-med philosophy and so forth, he finally got his PhD. And through that entire period, he had an opportunity to discuss philosophy with Ayn Rand across a range of issues. Um, and the perfect counter to his philosophical education at university. Uh, and then thereafter, he became uh, an important teacher in the 1960s of Ayn Rand's ideas. The first person to give, uh, to teach objectivism at a uh, real university uh, in the United States as a college teacher. And uh, thereafter, he participated in uh, all kinds of efforts with Ayn Rand, uh, epistemology workshops and so forth. In the 1970s, by the 1970s, he was delivering courses on objectivism. Ayn Rand uh, declared her, his basic course to be uh, the only accurate presentation of her philosophy that she was aware of. And before her death, she declared his book, his first book, The Ominous Parallels, to be the first book written by an objectivist philosopher other than herself. So, uh, and then in her will, she named him the heir to her estate and the executor of her estate. So he had an intimate relationship with Ayn Rand, was certainly the, the leading expert on her ideas because he had the most patience of all of her students in sorting out all of his confusions about it to the great benefit of all of us. And I cannot imagine the degree of uh, relationship that he uh, had with her. It must have been something really thrilling. And I have read this essay several times. And the thing that surprised me the most here is the kind of appraisal that this essay represents. And very specifically, the kind of appraisal of a mind. Uh, could you, do you think that there is an equivalence to Plato in regard to so to Socrates to, in, in his dialogues? Well, it is a very interesting collaboration. I would, I think it's different than Plato's. 
I think that the consensus, although they were ancient historians and really are our only sources about Socrates who didn't write anything himself, unlike Ayn Rand, who wrote a lot, millions of words, Socrates didn't write anything himself. And so we're dependent on Plato and Xenophon, uh, among other ancient sources who are even more secondary for uh, what the D Plato taught and what Socrates taught. And the consensus is Plato really added uh, considerable substance to Socrates' original thought. That cannot be said, I think, of Peikoff. Peikoff has had original insights, but the bulk of his life was simply devoted to understanding Ayn Rand's ideas and to uh, explicating them, uh, you know, elaborating them, making them uh, understand, answering questions he had and trying to make it even more understandable uh, to more and more people. So uh, it, it is unlike Marx and Engels, I think uh, that collaboration is not comparable. I think it's a very un unique actual collaboration. Ayn Rand was a beneficiary, I think, to a large extent of this uh, collaboration, but mostly it was a process of elaboration. The kind of portrait we get here is a very interesting one because it is mostly an intellectual uh, portrait of Ayn Rand an analysis of Ayn Rand, the thinker, how she approached issues, how she thought. But that was really the most fundamental, she believed that was the most fundamental thing about human beings in general. And for her in particular, it was, it was especially true because she was so consistent, thoughtful, and introspective. Um, so uh, he then goes into her personal, so a lot of personal details about her values and the way she lived and uh, her lifestyle. But those are all reflections in effect of her mental method. Um, and so it's a very unique and powerful intellectual memoir. Thank you, James. And, and I'm sorry, I'm having still some trouble with my internet. Um, but could you talk uh, about Ms. Rand's respect for ideas, which is the first thing that Dr. Pickup uh, is talking about in this essay? Uh, Ayn Rand is unprecedented in her understanding and uh, her appreciation for the power of ideas. She believed, and you could see it even in her earliest philosophical notes, that emotions, human emotions, um, a mystery, <laughs> a psychological mystery for ages, were a form of unrealized reason. They were the product of our evaluations and our cognitions. And she later came to understand that in much greater detail, how philosophy, how abstract ideas govern a human soul, a human psychology, their motivations. Why? Ideas, she understood, were the unique human form of understanding the world. Uh, the difference between uh, all other animals and human beings is our unique capacity to abstract and build abstractions from abstractions. That is an inescapable part of being human. That is how humans know the world is conceptually. And I uh, through the course of her life, she came to really understand that, to understand what concepts were. But even from an early age, she was thinking in principles. She was thinking abstractly. So an idea is an abstraction. And that's the way humans uh, work. And you can see it not only in individual psychologies, but you can see it play out in history. Ideas control are the most fundamental factor, at least, controlling human history and defining the course of history. The Dark Ages were dark because of the philosophic ideas that dominated that period. The Renaissance was the Renaissance, or the Enlightenment was the Enlightenment because of the ideas that dominated that period. The difference between the American Revolution in 1776 and the Russian Revolution in 1917 was a matter of ideas. One led to the triumph of the United States, the other to the totalitarian nightmare that killed tens of millions of people in Russia and the Ukraine. So Ayn Rand understood the power of ideas, both on the individual level and in the scope of history, and understood them to be the most powerful force, both in an individual's mind and in the course of human history. Could you ex also explain about something related to this, and that is the, her um, antagonism to irrationalism? that uh, Dr. Peikoff says that it's related to, uh, th that she says that whenever she hears something irrational, sh she imagines all her values being destroyed by this idea, and th that's why she wanted to combat this. Yes. Ayn Rand's Could unique... you comment a bit more on what that's, this means? Yeah. 
Ayn Rand's unique approach to ideas gave her a, a unique power with her concepts. Traditionally, the problem of a concept is a universal covering more than one instance. And uh, the relationship between universals and particulars has been a philosophical problem since ancient Greece. And Ayn Rand had the solution for it. On one hand, we have the intrinsicist approach that says that concepts, values, are built into the universe itself and uh, that has nothing to do with human cognition or human needs. The other school is the subjectivist, relativist school, the, the pragmatists and utilitarians who don't think much of concepts, uh, the reality of concepts, they're just conveniences in the human mind, you see, and each instance has to be each unique situation has to be judged on its own distinct and unique merits, case by case, see to your pants. Ayn Rand rejected both of these approaches. She understood that a concept was its, the meaning of a concept was not its definition, but the actual reference. Chair means every chair, and it means the chairs. Uh, she did not, she was not confused by metaphysical essence, nor, and intrinsicism, nor was she confused by subjectivism. She dismissed both. And so for her, all of her ideas, and from the time she was a child, she developed her concepts, her abstractions, from the facts, from her observation, up. So she knew what her concepts were, she knew where they came from, and so no matter how high up the abstraction chain she went, she saw the immediate reality and the potential consequences of an idea. So no matter how abstract the idea philosophically, in fact, the more abstract philosophically, the more vitally important the idea was, the more territory it covers, the more it could be a wonderful idea and have great consequences, or the more it can be a disastrous idea and lead to totalitarianism and human misery and guilt. So she underst by understanding the power of ideas, what they were, she could hear in an abstraction the actual concrete realities that that implied across the board. Now, for most intellectuals, that's not the case. They separate their ideas from reality with such a dramatic bifurcation. You've got abstractions, which are sort of a chess game up here that intellectuals play with. For Ayn Rand, that was not what ideas were. They were not an irrelevant chess game. They were life and death matters. They controlled the integrity of your own cognition, and they controlled the course of history. Nothing could be more important. So if she heard a skeptic, a universal skeptic say, no one can know any truth, uh, you know, uh, in itself. We can never really know anything. Then what Ayn Rand is saying, you can't know anything. You can't value anything. Therefore, my mind is impotent. Therefore, my values are meaningless. You, it, to her, she would see that as an assault on civilization itself. Indeed, an assault on all of her personal values. Just in the statement of the abstract, assertion. And that is a very rare thing to find, but it emanates from her unique understanding of concepts and their basis in reality. Dr. Pickoff also mentions this uh, example of uh, the, the crooked man on how she thought in principles. What does thinking in principle mean? And why is it, is it important? You know, she, Ayn Rand tells the most amazing stories about her childhood. Uh, essentially, around the age of five, she taught herself to read. And by the age of nine, she had decided that she would be a professional writer, a storyteller. By the time she was 12, mind you, she reports that she had discovered this thing called thinking in principles. <clears throat> The principles, this actual relationship between her experience and her observations and the abstract principles that she was reaching. And it was a practice, a mental practice that she automatized and maintained throughout her entire life. The reality of these principles. Now take, what is a principle? A principle is just a generalized uh, assertion, a principle that covers, again, more than one instance, many instances. And again, the higher the abstraction of the principle, the more territory it covers. So whether in physics, you know, Newton force equals mass times acceleration, that's a principle, a principle that governs motion at a certain level. And it applies to baseballs thrown on earth and the planets going around the sun, the same ideas. So a generalization can explain all of the observed movement 
that Newton could see. In the same way, Ayn Rand viewed ethics. So something like honesty or the political idea of rights were also principles to her. The idea that you have a right to free speech, a right to, you, to your freedom, a right to the, your own property. These are principles that cover multiple instances. And getting these principles right, what, what is their basis in reality, is all important. See, if you're a religious person, you don't really have principles. You have commandments, disconnected commandments. They're not connected to anything but, say, a commandment from God or command intrinsic view of reality like Kant. It's not that it does not have a basis reducible to reality. It's not a principle that works or meant to be worked in reality. Uh, to service is understanding and uh, actionable ideas in reality. On the other hand, again, these subjectivists reject principles, these utilitarians and pragmatists. Every situation has to be faced on its own uh, circumstances. Again, the seat of the pants mentality. Again, Ayn Rand rejected both. A principle, if it's based on reality, is the way we organize our information and can bring it to bear in our actions. And I think gives a great example of, of principles in one instance. She says, imagine trying to drive from New York across the North American continent, from New York to Los Angeles, without any map, without any other conceptual guidance. You're just gonna go see to your pants, whatever emotionally works well, whatever, wherever the weather might take you, that happens to take you. Of course, that's not the way to get there. You may never get there if you go that way. Uh, uh, a map is like a principle, you see. And what is the re relationship between thinking in principles and another idea that Do Dr. Pico talks about, which is thinking in terms of essentials? Well, for the essence is the fundamental. See, Ayn Rand was not an egalitarian about facts. Depending on the context, certain facts become much more important. For example, take I once more will use Newton. Some some things can be, for example, mass equals, you know, uh, force times acceleration, uh, or excuse me, uh, for, uh, uh, you know the principle. It is a principle that governs all moving things. In Ayn Rand's view of ethics, for example, it's the same thing. But in order to arrive at this universal principle, you've got to sort out the irrelevant details and you've got to see the common de uh, commonalities among the particulars and what brings the principle together and makes it a common principle. <clears throat> that is the essence. The fact that within our context of knowledge best explains and most explains what makes a principle a principle or a concept a concept. It is the the most important and fundamental fact that we've found that explains what a concept or a principle is. But recall, for Ayn Rand, a concept or a principle is its reference. It isn't just its essence. Its essence is our way of distinguishing it. it is, and it, that depends on our context of knowledge. It's not metaphysical. But the essence of something, say, <clears throat> that humans are rational beings, the fact that we're rational explains our science, our art, our sense of humor, our society, so much of what it all of, in fact, the things that make humans distinctive against other animals can basically be reduced to one thing, our mode of cognition. And so that is the essence of what it is to be a human, as opposed to, say, a featherless biped. <laughs> You could pluck a chicken <laughs> and get a fabulous biped and it'd be nothing like a human being, nor would it explain all of the other differences between human beings and the other animals. And I think one of another of, of the interesting things that, that Dr. Pico mentions in the essay is how uh, she would be able to see the print the the, the beginning of a uh, writing. And she would know how we, it would end at the end because she knew uh, how the building blocks of epistemology and your fundamentals worked. Could you comment a bit more on what it means to think in terms of fundamentals? Well, Ayn Rand had this extraordinary mind. She understood that content, for example, was dependent upon method. Before we could say what we know, we have to be able to justify how we know it. 
And, and for example, just from the outset. So what Ayn Rand could see is the, the importance of philosophical ideas and how they permeate every other field of human knowledge and, and endeavor. And so when she, she was a philosophical detective, and so she under by understanding the role of philosophy and the principles of philosophy and how they play out down the, the line in all other ideas, she could, as a philosophical detective, start out with an article or an essay or a book, read the first couple sentences or the first paragraph or two and say, ah, I got the conclusion. It astonished Peacock every time that she could see where the writer was going from their philosophical premises. And she was, that's how she thought. She knew that certain philosophical premises had implications and would have necessary implications down the road. Now, this capacity of hers, I think, comes from the fact that she was a novelist. She was trying to work out stories and work out a believable, you know, human uh, character. And she, th by that, she understood that to, un to grasp that in its essence is to understand the ideas and the values that motivate the character. And so her, under, her revolutionary understanding of the role of ideas, say, in human psychology or in, in human life, when we get to Atlas Shrugged, it's the role of the mind and human society as such and human survival as such. She understood uh, by means of principles what more basic ideas would lead to certain conclusions. And this sort of gave her an X-ray vision so that once she got your philosophical premise, she could predict the conclusion. Also, in the advanced version of uh, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, there is a Q&A uh, trans transcript at the end. And one of the uh, questions that comes up is, how did you come up with your uh, theory of concepts? And she answers, uh, in essence, what she, what Dr. Peacock talks in this talk, which is basically that she just made a, an introspection and in 15 minutes, the the idea would come up. But Dr. Peikoff mentions that this isn't, that, that there's something more biographical in, in Ms. Rand about that. Could you comment? Yes, you know, not having a background in academic philosophy probably helped her. You know, she read philosophy. She read Aristotle. She was familiar with Nietzsche. She read histories of philosophy. But fortunately, she escaped any kind of this academic corruption of philosophy. I think it would have been just miserable for her anyway. No, uh, the story goes, and it is an extraordinary story, how she was, she was a big fan of Aristotle. Uh, as I indicated, but she was having an argument in the 1940s with a Thomist philosopher who was explaining to her the Aristotelian theory of metaphysical essence. And she said, no, I disagree with that. Uh, and so he asked her, <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, what is your theory? What What is your idea of, of what universals are in their relationship to particulars? She took a moment, she paused, it took her a few minutes, it was introspection, she just looked inside, and she, what does my mind do? Literally, she asked herself, what does my mind do when it forms an abstraction? It took her, you know, a few minutes to sort it out a bit. Oh, I see what I'm doing is I'm for efficiency, you know, a unit economy sake, what I'm doing is finding a conceptual common denominator, which omits the various measurements that any member of that universal could have. Wow! a revolutionary breakthrough and the relation the, she solved the problem of universals this this age old problem in western philosophy by a simple introspective glance inward as brilliant as that sounds peakoff indicates in this speech why she was able to do that it comes back to this ability of hers and this habituated method of hers that began at the age of 12 in thinking in principles she was trying to understand every generalization, every inductive abstraction she came to in terms of the concretes. And she built up each of her abstractions that way and her principles that way. So in effect, what she was doing was simply explaining how it was her abstractions worked. It has its roots all the way back in that discovery of thinking in principles as she called it at the age of 12. Astonishing genius of, of the ages, it seems to me, yeah. Very much indeed.
I haven't uh, studied philosophy myself, but I studied a couple of years of it. And uh, it's surprising the whole, how revolutionary uh, this answer is and how innovative and original it is. Truly, truly. No, it's a revolution. It's a revolution in thought. By understanding the intrinsicist, subjectivist, objectivist trichotomy in uh, values, led her directly to understand that trichotomy in concepts as such because of her grip on principles and concepts. And this, of course, is a revolution. The philosophy, Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, even worse, Western philosophy has been dominated by two schools, basically an intrinsic approach to abstractions and values or a subjectivist approach to abstractions and values. Ayn Rand solved that problem and resuscitated concepts and principles as the vital thing they are. And in the process, resuscitated philosophy and human knowledge in general from the onslaughts of skepticism and pragmatism, utilitarianism, linguistic analysis, and all the corruptions of philosophy since Immanuel Kant. Indeed. Um, before, I, I want to change the topic to what kind of a woman she was. But first, let me thank Jeff um, which, uh, for his super chat and Robert for his super chat. He says, thank you for this important and inspirational discussion. Oh, thank you, Robert. So my question, James, is if you could comment a bit on the kind of woman that she had to be to write Atlas. And also she had very interesting um, ending of the wars like good premises and how on and how's your universe could you comment a bit on what th these things mean well first on the second you know she wouldn't just say good luck or goodbye or see you later uh her most frequent way of saying goodbye to her friends was good premises and in when she would greet people especially her friends or her students she, she would greet them with how's your universe <clears throat> this goes back to what we were saying before about the role of ideas in a, every individual's mind. It is our, what Ayn Rand called our sense of life, our emotional attitude toward the world itself emanates from our philosophical beliefs, whether explicit or implicit, <clears throat> whether consistent or not. Our belief about the universe, our belief about ourselves and our self-esteem and our relationship to the universe will control our attitudes, will control our psychology, will control our state of mind. She understood that. So when she asked someone, how's your universe? She's obviously an objectivist who believes in an independent reality and primacy of existence. She's not saying the universe has somehow changed. What she's saying is, how is your understanding of the universe? How is your relationship to the universe? Uh, how's your sense of life holding up? And when she would say goodbye, good premises is what she would say. In other words, it's not luck. It's not accident. It's how you think and how you approach life. It's your philosophical premises that will mostly shape your attitudes. So she's asking you to think, keep thinking, and keep connected with your ideas. Uh, good premises. It's not a, luck ain't a factor for Ayn Rand. So yeah, for Ayn Rand, um, ideas have you talk about what kind of a person she was her values because they are abstractions based on the concretes <laughs> she goes from the ground up so her concepts are based on facts and her facts are conceptually organized and her concepts are based on facts so that when uh she has a value she is in touch she's a, she is not only intellectually in touch with the concrete examples with the why why be honest? Why be ethical? To her, it's intimately connected and all connected up with all of her other ideas. So for her, each one of her ideas is of urgent, real importance. This is exactly the opposite attitude that you have from academic philosophers who say, oh, well, who can't? He, Leonard tells the story of the, the philosopher who gave a story, gave a lecture on why the concept of God is meaningless. And then when I said he was going off to synagogue to say his prayers and everyone was like, what? And he said, what do you mean? What does philosophy have to do with real life? as if it was just some chess game over here, some parlor game over here that had nothing to do with our actual living. 
Ayn Rand, of course, since her ideas were based in reality, she knew they were of life and death consequence. And therefore, the, 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 the practical importance of ideas was something she was acutely aware of in a way that no contemporary philosopher <laughs> since Kant has had. She, in fact, <clears throat> denies the separation that is, characterizes contemporary philosophy. And what about this idea of having favorites? Could you comment a bit more? Because I think it's one of the most interesting things that Dr. Pico mentions. Boy, is it, isn't it? Ayn Rand was a passionate woman and her ability to be naturally emotional in touch with her passions and values in that way was it, itself a direct result of her understanding where her emotions came from in her values and where her values came from in the facts of reality. To have those things connected meant there was no dichotomy in her mind between the rigorous logical analysis of her philosophy over here and her passionate reaction to concretes, whether in her personal life or in the political news of the day, the, the concretes of reality were intimately connected to all of her values and tied up, and her ideas were so integrated that every single thing was an implication, right? She could reduce her values to the concrete level. She could tell you why she believed, why this was her favorite, Victor Hugo was her favorite novelist, why she liked Vermeer as an artist. She could tell you why for all of her values, even her aesthetic values, even her emotional values, even why she loved her husband, all, the, all of that was interconnected. So there's no dichotomy between her passions and her emotions over here and her philosophic ideas over here. They, were, they came as one. And so she had favorites in every category and she thought that people should try to have favorites in every category that mattered to them. And so she had favorite music, she had favorite art, she had favorite, a favorite color, aqua, uh, this aqua blue, mar uh, marine blue. She, and she filled her life with her values. And she believed that's what you should do. Find the stuff you like the most, the music, the art, the colors, the food, the people that you really get the value from and pursue them self-consciously and passionately. It is only by being in touch with our values, it is only by, by knowing the objectivity of the values that they can have this full reality and passionate connection to our emotions. <clears throat> so we can get the full inspiration from them and the full enjoyment of them. I want to make a brief um, pause to thank Michael and Jonathan for their super, super chats. Uh, and also to Bonnie, thank you very much as well. And she asks, uh, was Dr. Peak of Professor E in the appendix to ITOE? Oh, yikes. I know he's one of them. <laughs> I just can't off the top of my head recall who was A, B, and C, D, and E, but uh, uh, he is one of them there. And he, and, he, and he at some point does reveal this. I'm very sorry, Bonnie, that I can't tell you which professor off the top of my head he was, but he is one of them there <laughs> for sure. I think Dr. Binswanger revealed recently the list um, yes. in his um, list. It is available. I just can't recall the A, B, and C off my head. Um, and also Jeff Bannister, he asks, uh, happy birthday. He says, happy birthday, Dr. Pickoff, and thank you, ARC UK. Thank you very yeah. much, Jeff. Yeah. On Friday, Leonard Peikoff celebrates his birthday. And this week, you can see we're doing a bunch of uh, stuff celebrating Leonard Peikoff. Um, also, I want to first touch the positive of, of her. And Dr. Peikoff very eloquently mentions uh, the question of if Ayn Rand was happy. Uh, could you comment a bit more on why he thought she was? Wow. Yeah. He only gives us three of the most powerful moments where he understood her profound happiness. First, she was a woman who pursued her happiness. She was a, a woman who pursued her highest dreams. She escaped the Soviet dictatorship on purpose. She came to America and had the 
she bear at the age of 21 she came to america a woman alone in the 1920s barely speaking the language she knew french she knew german she didn't and russian of course she did not know english very well I mean, her mother was a language teacher, and so she had some exposure, but she really didn't learn English until she came to America. And yet, about 20 years later, she's writing a best, you know, a huge New York Times best-selling novel that the movie rights are being bought by Warner Brothers. The New York Times is declaring it to be an, an American classic in the 1940s. So that 20-year span just shows how she would pursue her values. Um, how she would trip her husband. She sees this charming, good-looking guy uh, 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 on the set of a Cecil B. DeMille silent film in the 1920s, King of Kings, and she says, I want to meet that guy. So what does she do? She trips him on the bus that the actors are using. She was an extra on the film, too. So she trips him on a bus <laughs> to, to get to know him. Ayn Rand went work. If she found a person that she was interested in, the writers Isabel Patterson or Henry Hazlitt, she were she became friendly with them before her success with the Fountainhead. She pursued her values. She would hunt uh, record shops for the operettas and tiddlywink music from her youth that she loved so much. She was passionate and active about pursuing all of her values her whole life. And of course, she believed that it was the achievement of values that resulted in happiness. And here was a woman who achieved her values. As ambitious as they were, she accomplished them. She helped change the world with her ideas. Um, and I, to do that, <clears throat> I would say, was exactly the sort of thing that would manifest for Ayn Rand in happiness. We have all kinds of evidence that it did. And the three incidents that he gives are just absolutely moving. Maybe a couple of the most moving for me. 1957, October 57, Atlas Shrugged, her magnum opus, the achievement of her life, the achievement of her life came out. The full statement of her literary and philosophical insights finally published. She was walking toward the Random House uh, 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 offices in Manhattan with Leonard one day, and they pass a bookstore window, and there behind the glass is Atlas Shrugged, the big new novel from the biggest publisher in America, Random House. And she turns to Leonard and she says, never give up on your dreams. It's worth it. My God. <laughs> or when she's coming back from major surgery in the 1970s, she's gotten out of the hospital, Leonard and Frank are to have taken her home. What is the first thing she does? She puts on the most light-hearted, happy, what she called her tiddlywink music. And she picked up the baton, this little conductor's baton that her husband Frank had given her years ago. And she started dancing around the house, conducting the music. She dances around the house, coming back from major surgery. And so he thinks to himself, if I ever want to imagine a non-tragic spectacle, I think of that. I think of that. She was happy with her husband, happy in a way that it's really hard to describe. I had access to Ayn Rand's notes uh, and at the Ayn Rand archive, and I could see the dozens of little love notes, even when they were living together and not separated, that Frank and Ayn Rand would s share with each other. Now get this, this serious philosopher and artist who's so serious about everything, his nickname for her was Fluff. Fluff! and her nickname for her was Cabiho. So when he would see, when Ayn Rand would be bored at a party and sitting there all lonely, and she would insist that Frank would come over and squeeze on the couch next to her so they could hold hands. The, the simple happiness and beauty of their love for, for one another is another indication of her happiness. With Ayn Rand, happiness was not a question of the particular weather that day, if you will, but the climate of your life. Ayn Rand could endure harsh, unjust, vicious defamation of her character for most of her life. After Atlas Shrugged, she was assaulted and attacked in the most unjust ways possible. Was she affected by it? Yeah. But did that change her basic approach to life and how wonderful it was? No. 
in her last TV interviews, she's talking about how wonderful her life was, how wonderful life is, despite the enormous injustice she faced at the hands of literary and philosophical critics, at least most of them, throughout the 1960s and 70s. No, she was an extraordinarily happy person, very proud of what she did, deeply in love with her husband to the day he died, and beyond. Actually, I wanted to talk about how she never had an equal and Dr. Peikoff mentions that she had an equal in the soul, which was uh, her husband. Could you comment a bit more on that? Yes, and that is a, an amazing truth about Ayn Rand that has to be grasped. Of course, Ayn Rand was never going to meet her intellectual equal. Um, even meeting another genius wouldn't have done it because they've got their ideas and she had a very radical philosophy. She had a philosophy that, in my view, will take generations to sink in properly <laughs> into our culture. Uh, that's how radical her ideas are as a departure from modern philosophy and Christianity and Judaism that came before it, Platonism that came before it, dominating Western thought. So radical were her ideas and so brilliant were her insights that she was never really going to find uh, an intellectual equal in her life and Peikoff understood that. She was that extraordinary lady. On the other hand, she was, because of her own insight in part, able to find a, a, another human being who did appreciate her spiritually, who could appreciate her unique genius in his own way, in his own modest way, but he really could because they shared profoundly at the deepest level, more than anyone she had ever met and would ever meet, a man who shared her sense of life, her benevolent sense of life, her happy, lighthearted sense of self <clears throat> that she had from her tiddlywink music as a child and that he kept alive in her. He was a profoundly insightful person about Ayn Rand as well. There came a point Ayn Rand describes in her introduction to the Fountainhead where she almost gave up riding the Fountainhead and becoming Ayn Rand. And it was Frank O'Connor who stayed up with her all night long to convince her that she can't give up the world to those that we despise. In other words, he was playing, for those who are familiar with the Fountainhead, he was playing Howard Rourke to her Dominique, who, who she described as herself in a bad mood, and saving the Fountainhead, literally. Ayn Rand would say, all she said more than once, all of my heroes are basically reflections of Frank. Frank would be the source of many of the lines, best lines that her heroes would have. Uh, Frank, uh, uh, Howard Rourke, for example, when he says to Ellsworth Dewey, but I don't think of you. That was a line that Frank O'Connor said to someone else in a slightly different context, and she just lifted it. He had the individualist spirit and that calm, almost zen-like power of Ayn Rand's unique uh, understanding of egoism. In effect, he had the soul of Howard Rourke, and it was explicating that soul that actually was part of her inspiration in creating her characters. He was the one who gave Atlas Shrugged its title. He was the one who, hearing Ayn Rand's side of a conversation, uh, a, a telephone conversation, right, about what Ayn Rand's next work should be, said, you know, when she said, hey, what if every intelligent, creative person went on strike, right? What would you do then? She hung up and Frank said, you know, that would make a great novel. And so he had profound insight into her ideas, too. He was no dummy. Can you imagine convincing Ayn Rand of anything? No, he was not her intellectual equal. But there was maybe no one more sensitive to Ayn Rand's work, uh, deeply understanding it at the deepest level in some ways, and certainly at an emotional level than Frank O'Connor, whose sense of life matched hers like no one she ever knew. I'm just curious, do you happen to know what is the anecdote behind the I don't think of you of Mr. O'Connor? Uh, I know it was slightly different, but I don't know all the details. And. So I want to leverage on that book that you have behind of you. And uh, Dr. Peikoff mentions that there are uh, the detractors of Ayn Rand. Uh, could you comment on this, uh, these people and uh, what they wanted to attain and uh, what, why did they waited for to publish? Why did they went, waited for her to die to publish those things? Well, 
to get the full story, you really should read uh, my book, uh, uh, The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics. In, in The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics, I reproduce basically raw Ayn Rand's notes on her break with Nathaniel Brandon, and her insights as to these people are far more valuable than mine are, although I, I think I do a pretty good job of analyzing their own biographies and the terrific mistakes they make. Now, to understand that is a very complex thing. I think that there were fans of Ayn Rand from the Fountainhead, Nathaniel and Barbara Brandon, who were overwhelmed by knowing Ayn Rand. They were overwhelmed by the Fountainhead. They were overwhelmed when they met Ayn Rand, impressed by her. And <clears throat> perhaps at first they tried, because they were impressed with her, to understand to some extent uh, her ideas. But unlike Peikoff, they did not take them seriously. They did not incorporate them into their own lives. Uh, to them, it was to a certain extent, they were still in effect, if you will, victims of modern philosophy and as human beings, not honest human beings. At some point, they became exploiters of Ayn Rand. They lied to Ayn Rand across the board on several issues. Uh, now, anyone who knows Ayn Rand knows the importance of, say, honesty or the importance of ideas, as we were discussing earlier. And the importance of ideas was not a reality to them. They started mistreating this, ep this woman they called an epical genius in the worst ways possible, financially exploiting her and lying to her about, their, about what they were, was going on in their heads intellectually and about their private lives uh, when it was very relevant to Ayn Rand. Uh, personally and, and directly relevant to Ayn Rand. So they um, systematically violated Ayn Rand's ideas, the ideas of the woman they said was an epical genius who had changed their lives. So you can see they did not incorporate objectivism into their own lives. They did not take it seriously like Dr. Peikoff did. Now, when they were caught in their lies by Ayn Rand, of course, Ayn Rand ended her relationship with them. That did not stop them from lying about Ayn Rand. In 1968, Nathaniel Brandon flatly lied about Ayn Rand and the nature of his break with her, and that's obvious. So he lied to the, not only lied to Ayn Rand for several years about his behavior and his ideas, but he then lied to the world in 1968. <laughs> and of course, Ayn Rand, who was perfectly capable of defending herself, <coughs> You know, I had a very interesting experience myself. In 1982, I was the first person to interview Nathaniel Brandon at, for a, a college publication at his home after Ayn Rand's death. And it was right then and there he said, oh, yes, I will take up your invitation to come speak about Ayn Rand and give this ridiculous speech he gave, the benefits and hazards of the philosophy of Ayn Rand. He was waiting for her death to come out to criticize her. It was obvious from his uh, interview with me. Uh, so. Before, so that Ayn Rand could not respond, they did not write their biographies until after Ayn Rand had died. Ayn Rand dies in 1982, Barbara Brandon comes out with her book in 86, Brandon a couple of years later with the first version, because he'd have to radically sort of modify the first version of his memoirs, uh, because it was so biased and full of intense emotion. No, these people had resentment against Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, uh, and what did they complain about? Her anger and her moralism. Well, why did they complain about her moralism? Because they were systematic liars. Liars to her for years and then liars about her to the world. So, yeah, there are, there are sources of uh, memoir that people take seriously. Bi modern biographers rely, like Heller and Anne Heller, uh, right, <laughs> and others, uh, Jennifer Burns, they rely on critically on, because they claim to be first-hand reports, of the Brandons, when the Brandons are, in my view, discredited liars, public liars and private liars. And so, uh, you, you want my evaluation? They were getting revenge on Ayn Rand. They didn't like her anger at them for their dishonesty. They didn't like her moralism, however just it was in their particular cases. And so they took a, a lot of standard BS lines, uh, non-objectivist ideas incorporated into their criticism of Ayn Rand um, and in their psychological attack on Ayn Rand, which is mm, incredible on its face, full of contradictions and full of information that Ayn Rand has in her notes about the situation that they didn't decide to share with their readers, which would have dramatically influenced their credibility as biographers.
Thank you. So I have uh, two more super chats. Thank you very much, Gail. Uh, whose comment is wonderful insight into and, and, and learner peak of James. Thank you, Million. My pleasure. Thank you. And and Duncan, who asked, do you post the essay you are going to review each week somewhere ahead of time? I'd like to read it before the show, if possible. Uh, so it's posted in YouTube uh, a bit ahead of the show. Uh, but if you would like to know a bit more uh, in advance, uh, you can contact me um, in social media or in any other way that you can. And oh, I can Andrew has developed a list of the essays he wants to cover week by week. And so we know that generally speaking. So contact Alejandro. And we probably that's a good idea, though, Alejandro. We should probably advertise days in advance the essay that we're that we're going to cover. I agree. I agree. It's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Thank yes, you, thank you. So I think my last question is um, if you could give us some, maybe if you have something else to say about Dr. Peikoff as a student of Ms. Rand, uh, that would be relevant that maybe he couldn't have said in this yes. uh, essay. He, he, I am in a position, having been a student of Dr. Peikoff's, he is my teacher and my mentor like no one else. I've had great teachers, remarkable teachers, brilliant teachers, and he is by far the best teacher I have ever had. And I have had the opportunity to work with him, for example, on The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics or on a talk show, Ideas in Action, and working with him has been an extraordinary experience. It was, all I can compare it to is sort of Peikoff's own experience with Ayn Rand and the impact it had. But I would contrast Dr. Peikoff, for example, with the Brandons in particular. If they did not take objectivism seriously, if their lives consisted of trashing the most important philosopher of our time, the woman they said was an epical genius, um, dishonestly, dishonestly, then they, of course, did not take objectivism seriously or incorporate it into their lives. And their whole lives, in effect, were some <clears throat> tragedy where they really did not understand, appreciate uh, the historical chance they had to interact with Ayn Rand. Peikoff did the opposite. He was intellectually honest and sincere. He took it seriously. He took ideas seriously, as Ayn Rand did, and he devoted his life to sincerely understanding it. You know, he had arguments with Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand would get angry with him because of his misunderstanding sometimes. And sometimes he said that was unjust. Of course, it was from her perspective that she was getting angry. You know, she, sometimes she would put something in Atlas Shrugged. And of course, there's so much in Atlas Shrugged uh, that not everyone can get it. And so he would ask a question and she would say, well, didn't you get that from Atlas? And she'd point out the page it actually was. Oh, gosh, I didn't get that. Or <laughs> he wouldn't fully understand an issue. And it seemed clear to her, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and so he would have to say, no, but I didn't even understand it. She would calm down. She had this connection to ideas that made it obvious to her that, that she did not appreciate, even in, in a sincere student like Leonard sometimes. But she would usually calm down and get through it. You see, he had the patience that they did not to answer the tough questions to ask the tough questions, to ask about his doubts. They didn't give Ayn Rand that respect or benefit of the doubt to be able to be talked out of their doubts or questions or confusions. They just wrote Ayn Rand off in effect using the standard old ideas. Leonard never did that. Leonard was, he is the most intellectually honest man I have ever had the pleasure and privilege of knowing. And that's what I'll say. And he brought that sincerity and honesty like none of her other students did to Ayn Rand. And his own work is the magnificent result of that. Thank you. And if, if I may add, I, I don't know how to say how lost I would be, even after reading Atlas Rogue, if it weren't for his courses and his books. I agree. I agree. Leonard Peikoff is second only to Ayn Rand in my book as an intellectual hero. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, James. Thank is, you. Th is there anything else that you would like to say? Um, I really wish that people would consider this more than they would consider or other for example, works come out, for example, 100 voices, different witnesses about Ayn Rand, other material from other witnesses than the Brandons. It is sad that we even have to mention them, because in my view, they were habitual liars who cannot be trusted. And uh, historians are building on a foundation of sand when they rely on the Brandon biographies. Um, so I would urge people to look for other sources. Marianne Sures' book, uh, on Ayn Rand, for example, Harry Binswanger on Ayn Rand, for example, or all of the interviews in the Hundred Voices book that came out about Ayn Rand. Those are the credible sources about Ayn Rand, in my view. Thank you very much, James. And that actually takes me to an interesting point, which is that I that those books are in the library of the Ayn Rand Center UK, and I don't know the rules that Rassi points for looking at them, including yours, by the way, uh, James, it's in the library. Uh, but uh, I know, I think that they're available for um, members of the center. Uh, if you're in, in the UK, at least, you can take a look at them. Um, so please become a member of Ayn Rand Center UK. If you like this uh, kind of discussions, if you like discussions of Dr. Peikoff's courses, with James every Saturday. They're really great uh, for delving deeper into them. And um, yeah, basically please um, help us to get more of this. Um, and, and sorry, there is a last super chat from Lee uh, saying, showing appreciation from the UK. Thank you very much, Lee. And by the way, I, I thank you very much to all the super chats. I think it's one of the, it has been one of the greatest super chats uh, um, nights we've ever had so thank you very much to everyone that yes. uh, gave us a bit of money today thank you very much tomorrow i'll be discussing uh a little bit more my own relationship with dr peakoff on the daily objective i'm i'm looking forward to that james thank you very much thank you see you next